You're here today to hear me talk about a program um, that I have been running for the last two years. Um, and you and I are here for different reasons. You're here. Um, when I say you're here, I say you are incarcerated here for a reason. And I'm here for a reason, too. Um, it's not a place that I thought I would have found myself. But I did find myself here 15 years ago. This was the first institution I had ever been in. I uh, came in here um, to do a program such as this. And I was here to be a speaker because I am the victim of crime. I'm a survivor of crime. In 1995, um, my 17-year-old daughter was living with her father in Dover. And she was only probably not even five minutes away from me. Um, she had gone to go live with him. We'd been having problems, and she wanted to go live with her dad. Um, she knew there would be rules at our house, and she didn't want to live by those rules. So she went to live with her dad. Her dad let her quit school um, in her senior year at Dover High. And she was going to Groves Night School. And it was there that my daughter, Nicole Mosley, met LaVon Walker. Um, on March the 23rd, 1995, LaVon came over to visit Nicole. Um, she didn't know he was coming. Um, he knocked on her door. She saw that it was him. She put her 120-pound Rottweiler, Odie, in the garage because she knew that LaVon was afraid of Odie. She opened the door, and LaVon came in. They began arguing. They were in the kitchen. And LaVon reached over and picked up a butcher knife from the kitchen counter. He and Nicole fought over the knife. I know that because I was told that Nicole had defense wounds on her hands. Her hands were cut. Uh, LaVon stabbed Nicole in the stomach. He was 16 years old. Stabbed Nicole in the stomach. Nicole went to the front door to get out. She fell back in the hall, in the hallway, and in LaVon's words, he turned her over. Her eyes were still moving, and so he finished her off. He stabbed her in the carotid artery and twice in the heart. He drug her away from the door, went out. He had walked to her house that day, walked out, got in her car, and remembered that he had left a message for her on the answering machine. So he came back in, couldn't get the tape out of the answering machine, picked it up, finally threw it against the wall, got the tape out. He had left a message on there and did not want her father hearing that message and hearing his voice. He left. He drove to Philadelphia. Um, as he was going over the bridge, he threw Nicole's purse into the bridge, over, over the bridge, over the side of the bridge, after he took her money out of it. He came back 24 hours later in the same clothes that he killed her in and was going through um, the toll booth at Dover Air Force Base. And, of course, the police, 24 hours later, had been looking for him, searching for him. And they had helicopters. The toll booth collector saw the car, called the police. He pulled off and pulled into McDonald's and was arrested. I stood in my living room and watched as this young man was being put in the car. 
I stood in my living room watching, and I know there was sound on the TV, but I didn't hear it. All I saw was this young man with his face at the window, his hands behind his back, and he was angry. And all I remember thinking to myself was, why are you so angry? It is my daughter you have killed. Why are you angry? What are you angry about? It's me that should be angry. It's me. Nicole's soon-to-be stepmother came home that day and found her laying on the floor, stabbed to death. She did not know Nicole was dead. Nicole's Rettweiler, Odie, was sitting next to Nicole. Um, she got a Odie out, put Odie in the car. She called the police. She called the ambulance. Nicole was already dead. Uh, I was working. I worked for PNC Bank um, in Dover. I was working, and the phone rang in my office. Nicole was supposed to be at my office that day at 4 o'clock. Um, we are going to go shopping. Um, she wanted to go find a pair of shoes for a dress that she was going to be wearing that I was taking her to a play and she was she went to this place she wanted to go see. and So we were going to go shopping for shoes. She didn't show up. I knew something wasn't right. Nicole always showed up. And we were going shopping. <laughs> Who wouldn't show up to go shopping? So the phone rings, and it's my ex-husband. And he is saying to me that I need to come to the hospital, that he's there and Nicole's there. So I get to the hospital, and as soon as I walk in, I walk over to the nurse's station, and I tell them who I am. And as soon as I did, the nurse drops her head. So I know something's wrong. I know something's very wrong. Then I'm told that I need to come over to this area. It's enclosed. It's in glass. And my ex-husband's there. His fiance is there. They're both over in the corner crying. They can hardly speak. My husband's there with me, and I'm trying to get out of them what's going on. And all that can be told is that, you know, Sherry came home and found Nicole. You know, they don't know. You know, they're crying. In work walks the um, emergency room doctor. I walk over to her, and I said, where's my daughter? And she repeats to me several times. Your daughter was brought in. She was stabbed in the carotid artery and in the heart. Her heart was not beating when she was brought in. She's in the operating room. Again, I say, where, I need to go where my daughter is. Where's my daughter? She said, someone will take you. And I remember just standing there thinking, you know, someone has just taken my world and flipped it upside down. Nicole was my only child. I'm standing in a hospital with a doctor telling me that she's been stabbed in the carotid artery and in the heart. I'm still hoping she's alive. But my brain's telling me she's not. <laughs> but I need somebody to confirm that for me. <laughs> so... Finally, I say to somebody, you have to take me where Nicole is. I need to go now. Someone took me. I walked down to the emergent or the operating room, walked in um, with my husband and my um, ex-husband's fiance. And I said, um, where's my daughter? I need to know about my daughter. And 
the nurse picks up the phone and calls the chaplain. Well, you only call the chaplain if you need the chaplain, right? But still, somebody hasn't said the words. Somebody hasn't confirmed it for me. I'm still waiting. Finally, the emergency room doctor comes out, the operating doctor, and says, I can see that he's upset, and so is the nurse. And he says to me, I'm sorry. Hmm. Finally, confirmation. Okay. Because I'm one of those people who is absolutely stuck <laughs> until I have somebody, you know, move me out of that place. So now I know my, my daughter is dead. Um, all of a sudden, I hear crying. And it's Sherry, Nicole's stepmother, standing in the corner, long black hair, facing into the corner, crying and crying and crying. And I walk over to her and say, Sherry, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry you had to find Nicole. Because I just knew she was going to have to live with that for the rest of her life. I went home, got up the next morning, knowing I was going to ne need to make funeral arrangements for my daughter. A week later, we were taken to the police department with a room full of people. I didn't know. I was about to be involved in the criminal justice process. I was told that they were asking for the death penalty for Lavon, and they asked how I felt about that. <laughs> um, the prosecutor went around the table. He asked my ex-husband how he felt about it. He said he believed in it. He asked Nicole's stepmother. She believed in it. He asked my husband, who was sitting next to me, and he said he believed in the death penalty. And then he asked me, and I said, no, I don't. And the two of us just sat there and looked at each other. <laughs> but it doesn't matter what I think, what I believe, because the state sees the case as a crime against the state, not against me. You didn't get up in the middle of the night when Nicole was sick. You didn't put braces on her teeth. You didn't take her to school. She's not your child. She's mine. I have a right. I have a right to have some say about what happened to the person who changed my life. So I said, I was soon to find out I was going to have no say in this. I would be like an outsider watching this whole process. I needed to wait a year for the trial. Um, and what that l was like for me was <coughs> walking around in a fog because I could tell myself, Nicole's just not here. Maybe she's visiting her dad. She's somewhere, but she's just not here. My mind was not ready to accept the fact that Nicole was dead. I was asked if I wanted to see her in the operating room at the hospital, and I said no. Um, that's not how I wanted to remember her. Um, my ex-husband had an open casket at the viewing. I did not attend that. I didn't want to see Nicole dead. And maybe part of me thought, mm, if I don't see it, maybe it's not true. So I wait a year. And I don't know how to explain this to you. I've been trying to explain it for 15 years. 
I shouldn't say that. I tried to explain it for maybe the first five or six. And then I stopped trying to explain it. Um, I'm a person of deep faith. Um, I have never had any anger towards the young man who murdered my daughter. I don't know Levon. To this day, I still have never met him. But I'm not angry with him. And I don't know how to explain that to you, um, except to tell you that God just does things in people's lives. And I have never, I've been very, of course, very hurt. It's been 18 years. I don't usually come and tell my story anymore. I run a program where other people do that. <laughs> I bring them in and they speak. This is still 18 years. This is 18 years ago. And it hurts as much as it did 15 years ago when I told it. When I thought about today, this is not how I envisioned it. It's over. But there's more to the story. There's more to the story than my pain. The trial was a year later. I sat for a week. I watched autopsy pictures of my daughter being shown in a courtroom to people I didn't know. I saw her clothes with blood on them. 